Thank you to all of you for coming tonight. <clears throat> I feel honored to be able to introduce my friend, Lisa Miller. I met Lisa about 20 years ago at a American Psychological Association meeting and uh, have enjoyed our friendship ever since. My wife and I have been to Lisa's home. Lisa's been in our home with um, some of her children. Anyway, we've enjoyed uh, Lisa, her husband Philip, and their three children. Lisa is a wonderful friend of BYU. She has many friends here, and uh, it's great to have friends, isn't it? Uh, here at BYU, we're thankful for our friends um, at other places around the country. And Lisa is a wonderful friend of BYU and also the LDS Church. And um, now I, I could go on and on, but you don't want me to. And um, so I'm going to just read uh, the formal introduction for Lisa for those of you that are not familiar with some of her background. Lisa is a professor of psychology and education and director of the clinical psychology program at Columbia University Teachers College and is founder of the Spirituality Mind Body Institute, the first Ivy League graduate program in spirituality and psychology. Lisa is a foremost scientist on spirituality across the lifespan with her work published in top research journals, including Journal of the American Medical Association, Psychiatry, American Journal of Psychiatry, and the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Her innovative research is focused on quantifiable effects, <clears throat> excuse me, of spirituality and health resilience and thriving, and an overall sacred and joyful life. Her clinical and consultation work focuses on spiritual awareness and spiritual growth for individuals, families, groups, and organizations. Lisa is the author of The Spiritual Child, The New Science of Parenting for Health and Lifelong Thriving, which was recently published by St. Martin's, I believe, Press. Yeah. Based upon her decade and a half of experience, she offers talks, work, workshops, and consultations on spirituality and healthy development to parents and schools, adult wellness groups, and private and public organizations. She is editor of the Oxford Handbook of Psychology and Spirituality and co-editor of the American Psychological Association journal called Spirituality in Clinical Practice. She has been elected as a fellow by the American Psychological Association as well as for the Virginia Sexton Mentoring Award of graduate students. She's a graduate of Yale University and received her doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. She's frequently cited in print and in online media and has appeared on CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and the NBC Today Show. She lives in Connecticut with her husband and three ch wonderful children. And we learn more tonight about her dog as well. She has a dog that <laughs> the family loves. And Emily mentioned um, gratitude and joy. And uh, I'll just add one other word to Lisa. My dis short, the short description of Lisa for me is gratitude, joy, and love. And uh, thank you, Lisa. It's wonderful to have you here. We'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. That was a very gracious and generous introduction. It is an honor to be here at BYU. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for this very generous invitation. Um, Professor Richards, Professor Judd, Dr. Barrett, your invitation is deeply appreciated. And my gratitude to 
to the Wheatley Institute because you have brought me here in collaboration with BYU and this is a very moving and important time together for all of us. Thank you. Um, I have known Scott Richards for 20 years and in fact my children so adore the Richards family that every time we've been here they have so graciously hosted us. My children have come to believe the Richards family is one in the same with Utah. So when they heard I was going to Utah, there was a great deal of eagerness to come along. <laughs> but it happened to be a school week. Um, BYU has really been at the epicenter for the entire field of psychology in terms of bringing forward a spiritually oriented psychology. The landmark work over the past 20 years has in, to a great extent come from here. BYU, Dr. Richards, Dr. Bergen, many of your professors and colleagues have shaped the American Psychological Association and really moved us forward in understanding a spiritually oriented psychology. I, as part of this movement within psychology, have focused on the clinical science of children and adolescents. When we met in 1997, there was not a single peer review scientific article on spirituality in children or adolescents. And yet every day, plain as day, I could see in the clinic that children who had a strong spiritual life, children who had a personal relationship with their higher power, had an entirely different course of recovery than a child who had no connection to their higher power. Now, spirituality, as you know well in this room, um, is part of our core human endowment. This we know now from science. It is for 66% of people in the United States embraced by a rich faith tradition. Two thirds of people in this country experience spiritual life through a religious tradition. About 30% of people express that they feel spiritually connected but are not part of a faith tradition, although two thirds of those people believe in a personal God. And a small number of people will say, yes, I'm religious, but I don't know if I'm spiritual. For me, religion, that small number of people would say, is about my community, my heritage, my culture. So religion and spirituality are, for most people, overlapping. Spirituality is our natural endowment, our capacity for relationship with the loving, guiding, transcendent. And religion is an embrace of our natural spirituality. Now, here at BYU, as you probably know, you are, a shine, you are a city on a hill. You are a shining example that defies the national rates. But I bring forward, as you may be well aware, am I carrying, do you hear me? Yes, um, <laughs> that the rates of depression, the rates of anxiety, the rates of substance abuse amongst resourced communities middle class, upper middle class, resourced communities have surpassed the rates of suffering found in the inner city. Depression, anxiety, and substance abuse are more common amongst resourced communities and in good high schools than in communities where the majority of the students are on public paid lunch. So this is the dilemma of our time. My dear colleague, Sunya Luthar, looked under the hood to try to understand why this might be. For years, she worked down the hall from me at Columbia until she chose a better lifestyle and moved west. But, <laughs> but that said, <laughs> in her time, she looked outside of New York, she looked outside of San Francisco and a few other cities, and went into the suburban high schools and started to ask kids, you know, tell me, who's really, really big stuff here? Who's popular here? And there was no question, all the students had the same answers. Oh, well, that group of boys over there, they're very popular, and she's popular, and there was no question. A week later, Dr. Luther would come back and pull over some fresh kids and say, hey, could you tell me about that group of girls over there and that boy? And in this way, she determined the behavioral correlates of popularity in well-resourced communities. This was not the story of how one becomes popular, but the actual lived correlates of what went hand in hand with popularity. And in this way, through the back door, what might you imagine was the number one correlate of popularity in girls? 
beauty. It is in that ballpark. What? It was weight. Weight. Weight was the number one correlate. And the number two correlate, hair, what was it? Bus side, right, it was in that category. <laughs> The number two correlate was actually mean girls. It was interpersonal aggression used to instantiate rank. Now in boys, it was not the identical story. The number one predictor of popularity in boys, sports, sports athleticism. It was substance use. And the number two correlate was exploitation of girls. So in this environment, where popularity in well-resourced communities really constitutes what might be called an emotional penal colony. Right? It was clear that a mental health field, whether we were talking about children in under-resourced areas or children in well-resourced areas, a mental health field, a psychology that was silent on spirituality simply didn't make sense. And so together with colleagues here at BYU and our fellow colleagues across the country, we now have 15, 20 years of good science, rigorous science, that puts mental health and spirituality into the same place together. Now science, in my eyes, is not needed by any means to validate spiritual life. It is not a validation, but it is amongst our many forms of human knowing, a lens Upon, through which to witness spiritual life. We can have witness when one person stands up and offers a testimony, and we can have witness when in chorus a whole group of people stand up, which is a study sample, a thousand people's voices at once. So I see science and the social sciences as a lens of witness. So through this lens, what has been found over 20 years? What we have seen foremost is what every parent and grandparent knows that your child and every child is born a spiritual child. And in fact, science says very clearly, when we look through the lens, the gold standard within science of a twin study, twins raised together, twins raised apart, and factor out their degree of similarity as a factor of their shared genetic material, we see that the capacity through which, is exp which we experience spirituality is indeed innate. IQ is about 40% heritable. Temperament is about 60% heritable. A capacity for a personal spiritual life, a relationship with the transcendent, is about 30% heritable. It is in us. We are born with this endowment. And then, two-thirds, by the time we reach adulthood, of this capacity is cultivated through our community, through our socialization, and through the choices we make that bring forward the unique environment of our lives. This heritable contribution, like clockwork, surges in adolescence. There's a 50% increase in the heritable contribution from middle adolescence to emerging adulthood, which means from the inside out, there is an awakening of spiritual awareness, a hunger for meaning and purpose, nagging questions of ultimate concern, and the desire for transcendence and union. We see this in adolescence, and every culture through time has known this to be true. Science now, through this lens, says with puberty, biological puberty, there is a surge of spiritual capacity. This surge can be supported, and if it is, the spiritual core is formed in adolescence. Eighty percent less likely to abuse substances. Seventy percent less likely to have dangerous or unprotected relations. Sixty percent less likely to have recurrent major depression. These findings went through rounds and rounds of rigorous peer review in the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, Journal of Adolescent Health. It is not a matter of opinion. It is a scientific fact that there is nothing in the clinical or medical sciences as profoundly protective against the most common forms of suffering in adolescence as a strong personal spiritual life. What does that sound like? From the 10,000 foot aerial view, 
when we look at large samples of teens, we rely on their self-report. And other studies tell us that their self-report is pretty good. Those teens with a strong personal spirituality say, I turn to God for guidance in times of difficulty. When I have a decision to make, I ask what really would God want me to do? Relationships are spiritual events for me. Nature is sacred to me. Teens who see lived daily experience as imbued with sacred presence, who walk on spiritual bedrock, live a different life. And it's a healthier life, and it's a life far less likely to have the huge potholes that can really derail us in the second and, and decade. The way, in fact, that we might describe our spiritual life senior year over large numbers of people, all things being equal, tends to remain constant over the many decades of our life. If by senior year we have established a personal relationship with God, Allah, Hashem, whatever faith tradition we may have been from, a very personal relationship that is loving and guiding and positive with the transcendent, that lasts. We can have hard times, we can step to the side, but we have somewhere to always return. The road has been paved. Life looks different. In our follow-up study, I teamed up with Sunya Luther, and we looked at how her teens looked if they had a strong spiritual life amongst that emotional penal colony. Does anyone here, hello, hello, does anyone here in these large resource communities have a spiritual heart that feels connected? And what we found was painfully, only 15% of teens did. That's a quarter of the national rate. That is a lot of suffering. And when we looked more closely at that 15% of teens, we saw that indeed they were inured from the elevated rates of depression and substance abuse. Not only that, when we followed up with them at mean age 26, nearly 10 years later, they still had a strong personal relationship with the higher power and continued to be protected against what had become use of really more frightening drugs like Ritalin and, and dangerous, very dangerous drugs. They also had become members of communities of contribution. They had joined faith communities or done some sort of humanitarian action, such as, for instance, Habitat for Humanity. They were people of contribution and people of spiritual values. There's something else we found to bring in yet another study. A sustained spiritual life over time makes us look different on the inside. These are maps of brains of people who are my age. Fish. <laughs> now, these folks have for a decade maintained a strong core. I turn to God for guidance in times of difficulty. Nature is a spiritual place for me. The broad and pervasive regions that you see in red are regions of cortical thickness, the occipital, parietal, and precuneus regions. The cortex, as you may know, is processing power. Thick cortex is associated with high IQ, thinning cortex with Alzheimer's. In this particular portrait, we see cortical thickness in 85% overlap with those regions where other studies previously have shown cortical thinness in people with recurrent severe depression. This article, which we published in JAMA Psychiatry in 2014, was the, made the very strong case through three rounds of meticulous peer review that a strong spiritual life is neuroprotective against recurrent depression. Now, just to be clear, it is not that there are happy spiritual people that never get depressed and depressives who've lost their way. That is not the case. It's that the very same mechanism the v held up through the very same biological substrate through which we experience transcendence and love and the buoyancy of spiritual life also is overlapping to a great extent with how we can feel emptiness and the void. And in fact, subsequent work has shown that for over half the cases of depression, we are not always looking at pathology, but in fact, the knock at the door of depression is a spiritual opening, part of a spiritual deepening. And we can talk more about that in a little bit. So what is this spirituality, the one third that is heritable, the one third that if every human being on earth has it, with or without the embrace of a faith tradition, what does this look like? 
we set to conducting a global study into the expression, what might be called the phenotype of innate spirituality. And what we found in India and in China and in the US, and we're now looking in Iran and Brazil, were five common expressions of natural spirituality, the first of which was an awareness of oneness and interconnectedness. Everywhere on Earth, everyone understands our foundational interconnectedness, our foundational oneness, physically and at the level of consciousness or spirit, that we are all part of one life force. They understand this with or without the free expression of religion, as in China. And in fact, in China, the rates on all five of these phenotypes were higher than in the United States. The second phenotype, love. Love not merely as an emotion like happiness, but as a force an ontologically real, mutable force. A practice of transcendence, prayer, a mind-body practice, meditation, altruism, which you might consider perhaps prayer and action as sacred, and an examined life, often within a faith tradition, although not always, with limits and a binding moral code of who we are in relationship to ultimate reality. These five phenotypes are found around the world, but there's an interesting catch. In every other country where we have looked, the more educated we become, the more years of higher education, the more spiritually aware we become across all five phenotypes. But uniquely in this country, over large samples of people, the more educated we become, the less spiritually attuned and aware we become. And again, I think BYU is the exception. I think you are a city on the hill, and my treasured colleagues here are profoundly spiritually aware, and those who I've been honored to meet here are profoundly spiritually aware. But again, this is the cultural tidal wave of our time. So what does this mean for adolescents? Individuation, as we know, is the me and not me the testing and inquiring and questioning all that I've seen and all that I've learned against the knowing of my heart and the primacy and the importance of direct knowing. Well, through spiritual individuation, the spiritual core is formed from which all other lines of development seem to flow. And here we have life with and without a spiritual core. Life as a soul on earth as compared with life, essentially as a bag of parts. I'm good at football, I'm good at math, but I'm not good at English, and I'm so-so at tennis. A bag of parts versus someone, a being made of life itself, a being of inherent worth. A being of inherent worth, a soul on earth, searches as a teen for meaning, for purpose, for calling. And all the good stuff and the bad stuff I've been given are endowments towards fulfilling my calling. So the day that I get a C, that is just noise in the overall trajectory towards fulfilling my purpose. But the day I get a C, when all I am is good at math, is a crushing day. It is not surprising then, given the primacy of the spiritual path as opposed to being a bag of parts, that a strong spiritual core is associated with all of these terrific character strengths and virtues. In fact, this is the chart. You can see over here is daily spiritual experience. Nature is a spiritual place for me. I turn to God for guidance. And daily spiritual experience for 84% of teens is predictive of all other character strengths and virtues. They go hand in hand. So for the blue children, way up high, we see that the very same child who has grit, has optimism, has meaning, and is highly spiritually aware. And for the red child, who we care about very much, the very same child with low grit has low optimism and low meaning and is not spiritually connected. There is an exception, but overall, the general rule is that a spiritual rooting, the core, and the character strengths and virtues go hand in hand. About 15% of teens and 20% of adults describe themselves as humanists. There is about one in five 
amongst in our country who are virtuous humanists. And it is possible, getting back to our crisis in education, to envision a way of including everybody at the table and holding in an educational space a discussion of who am I and what is my contribution in light of my relationship to ultimate reality. That includes the 80% for whom the character, strengths, and virtues are rooted in spiritual life, and the one in five who is a humanist. It is a way of moving into this cultural wave in an inclusive, open-armed format and having a spiritually-based discussion in publicly funded places. Um, in the first decade, what do we see as the expression of natural spirituality? A spiritual compass. Every single child knows right from wrong. It may be irresistible at, a, <laughs> at any given moment. For instance, my beloved oldest child, Isaiah, when the new baby came home, he was so excited, and he bestowed his great gifts upon the new baby, his favorite blanket, his favorite foods, <laughs> hard foods, and his most cherished Thomas the train. But it wasn't too long before I heard, Mama, <laughs> and he was dangling Thomas over the new baby and deployed Thomas. So he knew his compass was intact. He was born with that compass and he had it. It was irresistible at that moment not to not follow it. But the child knows. Every child loves prayer, loves ceremony of all faith traditions. I met with a woman who taught Sufi prayer to children, and she said, oh, the children, they're the best at it. They come right in, and they start to sway and move, which is so central to their prayer. Children love ceremony. A child is in relationship with all living beings. When Isaiah was 18 months, I wrote in the spiritual child, at the time he met baby geese, and he was ecstatic. He ran up to the baby geese, and they were still kind of yellow, which meant they were equivalent of 18 months. And he was playing with them, and with such joy and such enthusiasm that he had terrified Mama Goose. And Mama Goose turned, and boy, she went, hiss. But when she hissed, it was not at Isaiah. She had turned all that way to hiss at me. Because I had violated the universal rule of parenting, which is to watch my children to the safety of another. Just as on the playground, we would hope that every child was watched and not how often hit our child. Right? <laughs> so this was an awareness on the part of the child, in this moment Isaiah, but every child, that we are in relationship with all living beings, with geese, with the family dog, and all other living beings are aware of this relationship. If you put a dog in an MRI, as was done at Emory, the dog has the same neural correlates of love as do we. Family, as you know so well in this beautiful community, family as a spiritual event, family as a spiritual absolute. The child will say, is everyone coming? Right? Is grandma going to be there? Will daddy be back for this? The wholeness of family, the completeness of family. And so too that is sometimes brought to places that are very special, a Sunday school class, their classroom at school. Eloise was not there today. Apparently, she's not feeling well. I don't know that I always notice who isn't at work today, but it seems to me a spiritual absolute. The child feels whole when we are whole. A child, as we know, comfortably engages life and death. They want to know. And in fact, studies have shown there is an implicit spiritual cognition in children. Until socialized otherwise, a child sees into life and looks at us as having continuity of spirit after death. A child assumes continuity of spirit after death until socialized out of that. And I'll share with you this story. Um, again, it's an Isaiah story because as my oldest child, I was not yet exhausted when I raised Isaiah. <laughs> There's a preponderance of stories about Isaiah. Um, Isaiah was at the funeral of our great-grandpa, his great-grandpa, my husband's grandfather, Papa, we called him. And in the Jewish tradition, when someone dies, you take a shovel of earth and you put it on the casket. And it's a way of knowing through your very being that the person has passed. So Isaiah took, this little Isaiah, a garden spade, and he put earth on Papa's casket, and he looked at me and he said, 
the body goes back to the good earth and the soul goes to God. And I said, yes, Isaiah, and of course mirrored what he'd said. A week later, we're outside in our backyard, and Mama, Mama, come here. And I race over, and he says, look, and his eyes are sparkling. And there's a turkey carcass right across our yard. Mama, the body goes back to the good earth, and the soul goes to God. It was sparkling and aware. And the child is naturally capable and delighted in a very deep, moving, numinous way to know of life and death and continuity of spirit. Now, the decision to bring Isaiah that day was um, not the popular one. <laughs> when we showed up, the eight other cousins had not come. And I assume, because they're a very loving family, it was for fear that it was traumatic to them. And while every parent is an expert on their own child, there is no such thing as a parenting expert who doesn't live in the same house. Right? Every parent is an expert on their child. There is a great capacity in childhood to embrace the truth of life and death and to, for that to be a spiritual awakening, a portal to a deeper spiritual knowing. And in Isaiah's moment, he was able to make a contribution to pop-up that was meaningful to him. Spiritual agency, children love generosity, right action. Going to the homeless shelter, they leap around. They are so excited to bring clothes and to bring food. And of course, we know children have profound dreams and mystical experiences. And when a child, you know, I can, I can tell you at APA, I have been pulled, American Psychological Association, way, way, way over in the corner by a colleague, <laughs> senior colleagues to say, I have to tell you a story. I had the most beautiful spiritual experience. And they'll go on to tell me something that is such a beautiful gift, a very sacred experience. And then they'll say, I've never told anyone that story. And they'll say, when did it happen? And they'll say, 30 years ago. And it's been put in a back drawer of their mind. This beautiful experience, which is a porthole. It's an opening of the door. Right? When our children come to us with mystical experiences, I don't need to be a great expert. I can simply say, wow, that is so beautiful. That is such a blessing. That is such a bright, loving gift. I bet that might really open up in your path in life. Now, what can we do to support spiritual, natural spirituality? A sacred language. And so much of this you already know and do. So I hope you enjoy this as science reflecting back your wisdom. A practice of direct connection shared with our children. Would you like to finish my prayer? Do you want to sit by my side while I meditate or do some reading? Transparency into our own spiritual life. You know, mommy was really aggravated today and grumpy, and I'm, and I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, and I'm going to apologize to you, and I also want to apologize to God, because today was a gift, and I feel that somehow I squandered it. Will you join me in renewing us? So the utter openness of our own spiritual life, even in my foibles and in my struggles, and that includes you know, going back to the checkout counter if I've lost my cool, and apologizing in front of my child. Awkward as that may be. <laughs> the child remembers it forever. And when we share in the first person of our spiritual life, they are riveted. They are absolutely riveted. My mother was very explicitly spiritual and prayed out loud and sang prayers out loud. My father was a very contemplative, quiet person who was less explicit about his spiritual life. But the week that his mother died, he shared with me a dream. I was only nine years old. And we sat down side by side, and he said, I had a dream of Grandma Ellie. He said, Grandma Ellie came to me, and we were walking down the street, Grand Avenue in Des Moines, Iowa, where he had grown up. And they had walked so many times. And he said, Grandma, who wore beautiful clothes and loved to dress up, was actually in a very plain, simple gray suit. And I took it to mean as we walked side by side, Grandma in this ordinary daily suit, that she was my mother and would continue to walk by my side. She would always be my mother. He did not have a theological interpretation of that. He shared his experience. And it was full, and it was generous. And I remember it to this day. 
I think that those are the jewels that we give our children, our own moving personal spiritual experience. And those are the moments where we pass the torch. Our embodied spiritual life, science says, is the inroad to the child's spiritual development. A child who receives spirituality not from a book in his or her 20s, but a child who receives spirituality as a lived experience from a loving parent, a loving grandparent, takes it that in in the very deepest of ways. For instance, spirituality passed through one generation is 80% protective against depression and offspring. Spirituality passed through two generations, grandparent, parent to child, is 90% protective against depression and offspring. There is an interweave of the deep, authentic love of the parent and grandparent and child with the sacred presence. In the spiritual child, I speak of that as the field of love, the inextricable deep love of the family infused with the transcendent ultimate love. That is the passing of the torch. That is the formation of spiritual life in the child. I'm gonna, oops, I'm out of time. I'm just gonna make a few more points. One, most of all, important, and I think because BYU has really been a leader here, is our crisis of spiritual multilingualism in this country. By the time a child is six, Mazarin Benaji and her team at Harvard has found that a child is less, a child thinks their name for the higher power is more real than the name ascribed by a family down the street of another faith tradition. <coughs> and that by the time a child is six, he or she is more likely to share their peanut butter and jelly sandwich with a child who uses the same name for the creator, for the higher power. So, the opportunity to say, yes, in our family, there is a rich embrace of our faith tradition. And still, in my spiritual heart, I can feel the universal spiritual truth in the words of the family down the way. I can hear in their language and in their symbol and tradition, not just that they do things differently, but it, I can hear through their words and feel through their words the illumination of my own spiritual heart. That is an understanding of multilingualism where BYU has made enormous contributions. And in fact, I woke up and had breakfast today, and at the guest house, there were three people here for a shared interfaith dialogue. So you have really been the leaders in this area. We have a world at war. We have a world war, and we have a divided country. And I think that spiritual multilingualism is a tremendous, probably the greatest educational opportunity of our time. So I am grateful, and I honor you for your leadership here. Um, there is more to share. It's in the second half of the book. <laughs> so I, I want to thank you for, for sharing this evening, and I'd be delighted to engage and share some conversation. Thank you. Thoughts, questions? This is just um, incredible. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, everyone, for allowing you to be here today. This is just, I'm so amazed at ev everything that I've heard. Um, as I was saying, I have an opportunity to travel to the United Nations yearly, um, specifically to attend the Commission on the Status of Women. And um, there, just this past year, uh, these past couple of weeks, um, I was able to meet with um, some incredible people from Sweden. And they are very concerned because of um, very um, concerted efforts to sever um, the ties between parents and their children and um, a lot that they've expressed um, are um, you know the secular humanist kind of philosophy um, and then the move to um, push children into you know um, daycare facilities and before school programs and after school programs um, at very very early ages and they were saying that now um, 20 years of doing this that children are so psychologically just empty and just the rates of suicide and depression and anxiety and lack of attachment to you know so they're having this massive epidemic and um, it seems to me though they were crying out to say you know you guys 
you know, the US, you guys are heading towards that same direction and so many countries are getting pushed in the same direction. And I guess my question to you is, um, how can your work be expressed on a larger scale because I feel like the spirituality connection um, with parents and um, just all the benefits, psychological benefits of spirituality, it needs to be shared um, worldwide, really. But then the trajectory that we're going to as a nation, um, I don't know how, I guess my question is, how can we amplify your work? <laughs> um, and, you know, is there, um, I don't know, what are your thoughts on that, I guess, from a political a standpoint? Yeah. Do, do you have a thought? What's that? Do you have a thought? I do. I want to take you to the UN next year yeah. with me. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> and I also want to get you some lectures in Sweden to share this, your message with these groups because they are yearning to hear this. Um, and I heard firsthand from, from mothers that are aching, saying, I, f I want to be a mom to my child, but when I take my child to the well health check they they're pushing my child into these and, and they just are seeing that they don't have any confidence in themselves as parents and just the psychological damage that's happening to these adolescent youth and it's just not being shared and nobody's talking about it because they just don't have any any language to talk about it with and so what I see here is that you're providing language mm -hmm. for the first time and it's so needed right now and so anyway I just are you available <laughs> next year? <laughs> Thank so, you. I'm sorry. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. Um, so first of all, thank you for coming here and sharing what you have. It's very uplifting and, and gratifying in a lot of different ways, and I'll share with you why. Um, as a as an individual in my age group, I guess, d dubbed millennials, um, much of what you're saying, um, talking about children having mystical experience, experiences, the relevance of spirituality, and, and every, it, more or less the gist of your entire message is something that isn't just viewed as irrelevant, but almost laughable by sections of a lot of the academia that I deal with outside of BYU and a lot of my own peers who feel similarly, who. Uh, aren't religious or were religious and feel that it's more progressive or intelligent of them to, to eschew that. And I guess my question is, um, as an academic, particularly as a woman presenting this, this awesome research, this valid research that isn't necessarily exclusively driven by religious morality, how, how do you combat that? How do you, how do you face what people offer I guess the general sentiment in my perspective as complete, well, not necessarily disdain, but just the feeling that such a belief system is irrelevant and that it, there's no place for it in academia. Thank you. Thank you. So scientists are passionately curious and follow the numbers. And my scientific heroes, I have other heroes, have actually been fascinated and engaged by this science. Some of them had a strong personal spirituality, some did not, but they were curious and believed the numbers. So I've never had a good scientist get in my way. I'll say that. Now, the cultural tidal wave that you describe, we know this to be the case, right? The cultural tidal wave. And the language of science is, is not a language of opinion, right? It is, it is simply true that we are endowed with an innate spirituality. It is simply true that when we cultivate our natural spirituality, it is the greatest source of thriving and health in all the medical and clinical sciences. So these are facts. Um, and my view is that when science speaks, it speaks directly. Um, and I, I have not found there to be any problem. Um, now, the, the point you're raising, though, I think is valuable. Um, I will have students in our graduate program, our spiritual mind-body um, program, say, you know, I had this experience, and it's a beautiful experience, and it's an important experience, and they know it in their inner wisdom to be powerful and a blessing, and certainly true. Right? And at the end of the sentence, they'll say, I hope this doesn't sound really unscientific. Right? 
that is a 20th century leftover, right? Because science is merely one of our many forms of human knowing, right? Science is a lens, and we can turn it to the stars, we can turn it to a biology specimen, and we can turn the lens of science to the human life course and the enormous impact of spiritual life over the lifespan. So science, there's nothing unscientific about spirituality. Science is simply a, a way of knowing. It's one epistemology among many, alongside intuition and inner wisdom and mystical experience and logic and all others. And the skeptic is welcome to sit at the table and share in this discourse. In fact, the skeptic can even propel faith. Right? But the skeptic is never the bouncer at the door. And a scientist would never put the skeptic as the bouncer at the door. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. I guess this might not be helpful. This is still kind of loud. I talk really loudly a lot, so I'm trying to make sure that. Can I explain who you are? Absolutely. <laughs> this is the niece of my high school and college dear friend, my <laughs> dear, dear friend. Um, Heather Houston Rosette, I am godmother of her child, and this is her niece. <laughs> and I had no idea that you were speaking at BYU, so I was like, on the BYU page, like, oh my gosh, Lisa Miller, they've all been talking about her, and I haven't met her. Um, so I guess I've been trying to find a little more information from these two questions that have already been asked. Um, we're in situations where we don't, I mean, we're not... Uh, experts in your research yet. We're really excited by everything you've shown us and it rings true to us and we want this message shared. You know, we wanna, we're kind of evangelical about things that we care about and this is certainly um, something that we do. And, uh, but I still don't know how uh, our peers of the millennials and a lot of times conversations with friends who are meaningful and sitting around, I mean, it's, I'm 33 so it's, it doesn't happen to me as much, but um, in college in the dorm rooms or at the lunch rooms, you're having passionate discussions and people are deciding what they believe and convert to new things every day. Um, they're conversations of passion. And what vernacular, how can we enter in, I mean, and you think about social media too. We don't have time or um, practice in engaging and leading discussions so much with our peers where we can say, here are the numbers, here's the backing. Um, but we wanna share this message. And, uh, and I think for me too, especially, passion can sometimes get in the way and create a barrier. How do we um, bring this discourse into our everyday you know, social media? Because, I mean, how do we break that label of, oh, I'm a faithful Mormon from Utah, and so you're not going to take the things seriously that I say, and everyone takes, you know, information that I, I don't really know what I'm asking. I'm kind of thinking out loud, but how do we amplify this message, and how do we, um, how do we give this message with credibility um, when we're trying to, do you understand kind of what I'm trying to say? Because I don't. Thank, thank you for sharing. What, what strikes me as you're, as you're sharing, generously, thank you. Is, is the power of your authentic voice, the power of your direct spiritual inner knowing. And that it, speaking authentically and truthfully, you are a teacher. And whether or not someone else immediately agrees is irrelevant because you are speaking truth and you are a teacher. That helps. Okay, thank you so much. One more thought. <laughs> that you may have planted seeds, and it may not be for four years no, that that person yeah. has a realization. What were you going to say? I was going to say it sounds a lot like, you know, in our culture, you know, bearing your testimony mm -hmm. of the spirit in our faith, and um, that you plant the seed, right? Mm -hmm. That it's, you give it sincerely, everything that you care about, truth, and, um, and you hope that it's received, and that you yourself are a receiver of That's very generous. And in my, in my own path, I found that I have never regretted speaking what I felt in my heart was spiritual truth. But there are a small number of times I've been silent, and those I regret. Yeah. Yes? 
Yes, yes, hi. So one of my research interests mm -hmm. um, has to deal with increasing resilience in LGBT youth. Mm -hmm. And typically um, we see that religious organizations aren't really interested in encouraging spirituality in these in this particular population what can we do as members of communities and as religious leaders to encourage spirituality in this particular population so from the view of science i am not aware of a study that has addressed that question specifically but I am aware of studies that show that for everyone on Earth, irrespective of their sexual orientation or anything else, a personal spirituality, a sense of personal relationship <clears throat> with the higher power is a source of thriving. <coughs> and that includes a specific study on the LGBT population, that teens who identified as LGBT with a strong personal spiritual relationship did better than those who did not. That is the only study I know. Do you know what the, who did the study? <coughs> I do. It was a student at Columbia. And in okay. fact, I could put you in touch. Okay. Yeah. Good. Hi. Okay. I just wanted to just express how grateful I am that you're here. It's, um, I feel like I'm safe to say is your answer to one of my prayers. Um, I, I'm focused, I'm a student here at BYU. And I am focused on working with children that have been sexually abused. And so I really found this so interesting because um, you talked about their resilience and they were just innately born with that. Um, but I have recently found some studies that show that those children that have been abused, there's kind of, they detach and they get to a point where they're kind of, well, they're psychopaths and it, they no longer can feel remorse and they just can hurt and they don't feel it because there's a hurt inside of them that they're just lashing out and they are unable to be empathetic. Now, in your studies, have you found uh, a way that maybe is there, sorry, have you found that there isn't a point of return that is or can it, can it be reversed? So that's a very important question when there's been severe trauma, including abuse. What happens spiritually? There, I can share with you two perspectives. One is there um, is a study that showed that through post-traumatic spiritual growth, survivors of abuse who lean into that, go through the tunnel of pain and darkness and come out through a spiritually embedded process, can often end up with a, a strengthened spiritual life. And when that happens, when that happens, people to survive abuse into a stronger spiritual life actually are doing better than people who never to have confronted abuse but not have a strong spiritual life. So post-traumatic spiritual growth through the process to the other side actually can put us on a stronger spiritual footing in some cases. The other thought I have is that one of my great heroes from right here, right, used to take boys out into the desert, Gary Weaver, many of whom were survivors of abuse. And as I always understood his work, when a judge had seen a boy three times, rather than lock him up, he sent them to Dr. Weaver. And Dr. Weaver had over an 80% success rate with these boys, working at a foundationally spiritual level. So I, I don't think there's a point of no return. I think that. This is our birthright. It is always there. Okay, and we are spiritual beings, good. souls on earth. Okay, and so, would you? Sorry, really. Go ahead. Um, would you say that? Because I hope I get to the point where I'm able to just get out there and and help. Obviously, even if it's just one person, it'll be enough to be able to, I don't know, satisfy that need that I have to want to help them. But um, will there? Do you believe there'll come a point where I'll be able to sit with a client, not in an LDS kind of service, but be able to use these methods in helping them? Yes, I think you can do that tomorrow morning. I think that what your, um, the depth and contour of our own spiritual journey is the workspace from which we start. And that allowing you know, a client-centered perspective 
irrespective of their faith tradition, welcoming in their own spiritual voice, their own spiritual heart, and working from that field of love is right there for us. And in fact, APA now has two peer review journals, American Psychological Association, two peer review journals, one of which is spirituality in clinical practice. So we are here. Spiritual treatment is not a hope for tomorrow. This is done now, and it is psychology. We are, we are here now. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Great. <laughs> great. I was about to suggest that we do one more question. Since there are two of you, will you just try to be brief, and we'll finish up. And I actually was going to say thank you for sticking around, because I know this is not the first time you've done this today. This so is I appreciate wonderful. This is my greatest joy in so life to share schedules. this work together. Um, you've talked a lot about children and adolescents and that kind of development, and I'm wondering if a child or an adolescent has missed that in the earlier years. Is it something that they can kind of catch up to later? And if so, do those benefits that you've talked about, do those carry over as well? Thank you. That's such an important point. So if in the first and second decade we pave the way to natural spirituality, it is always easier to get back there. But that said, this is our birthright. and it is always a quarter inch under the surface. This is who we are. We are naturally, innately spiritual beings. There are moments where it's easier to access, as we know. For instance, around the edges of life and death, a birth or a death or an illness. The spiritual reality is abundantly apparent. There are passages in our lives. So for instance, the surge in adolescence, or as Carl Jung talked about, the awakening with midlife, the deepening and the going inward with midlife. We have nicknames in our culture, sophomore slump, midlife crisis, but these are actually ultimate spiritual chapters in our lives and their callings and opportunities for our spiritual deepening. So yes, it is ours and it, this is not the only opportunity. Every day there's 20 opportunities and even if it starts with saying a prayer from our childhood, awkwardly at first, we get back there or being with people we love in nature and appreciating nature as creation of the higher power. We get back there. It's this close. Yeah. Hi. Hello. My name is Jessica Cannon, and I've been really awakened to this topic about a week ago in creating a more abundant and creative lifestyle that is spiritually abundant. Um, and it's so, my question I guess is, how can someone with difficulties in their own lives and with people that are affected by these difficult challenges and mental illness and, and other psychological disorders, that how can we envelop them and our love? How can we create that abundant lifestyle in ways that will create that for everyone or more and just beyond what we can see right now? Thank you. That is very beautiful and very generous. And you are at the world center for that work. So I invite you into your deep, deeply thinking spiritual community. There's many opportunities there for learning of just what you're wondering. Thank you. Thank you for this evening. It's beautiful. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, we'll hope to see you again at another Wheatley event. We always say that at the end. This is our last event for this semester. So have a lovely summer and we'll see you in the fall. Those of you um, who would have an opportunity tomorrow morning, there is one more time that Lisa will be available and speaking to faculty and students. Uh, this one will be in uh, the Joseph Smith Building for tomorrow morning at 9, is that right? In 382 JSB. So um, if you'd like another opportunity to interact, there is that one more. And um, thank you again for being here this evening.